don't block the, the path of inquiry. Don't lay down rules that make it impossible for people to ask important questions. Welcome to the Thought Stretchers podcast, where we hope to stretch your thinking about important issues in education through rich inquiry. My name is Drew Perkins, and I'm your host for these heterodox conversations for complexity. Hello again, and thanks for tuning in. As we wind down for many of you towards a holiday break and a much needed rest, I do want to say thank you for listening and for being a part of the Thought Stretchers education community. Just a reminder that wegrowteachers.com is our website, which has all of our professional development offerings. We do lots of project-based learning work, lots of differentiated instruction work, certainly everything through the lens of inquiry, and there you'll find other things like assessment, literacy, growth mindset, some leadership work, and other things as well. So again, please visit wegrowteachers.com if you are interested in looking for high-quality professional learning and professional development. I also wanted to mention that we are getting closer and closer to an official launch for our Thought Stretchers community. You can find that at thoughtstretchers.org. We're in the final build stages, which will include blog content, events, a forum, sort of a social media feed, and some community aspects where folks can interact and hopefully discuss in good faith and complexity and with nuance really important issues in education from the culture war to pedagogy and everything in between. Once we get it launched, we'll very likely have an initial phase where we will have folks trying it out and giving us a little bit of feedback. If you're interested in being a part of that, please again go to thoughtstretchers.org. You can sign up to be on the email list and we will reach out when we get ready to launch, hopefully very, very soon. As always, please feel free to reach out to me at drew at thoughtstretchers.org with comments, questions, concerns, or any other issues that you'd like to talk with me about. Americans on opposite sides of the political spectrum don't just disagree on the issues. More and more, they can't stand one another. This partisan animosity is the crisis of our time and threatens our nation. Braver Angels is here to address this. Our mission is to bring Americans together to bridge the partisan divide and strengthen our democratic republic. But no single organization, no matter how successful, can be powerful enough all on its own to heal this divide. If our goal is really to strengthen our democratic republic, our only practical strategy is to ignite and shape a broader movement for civic renewal. That's why we started Braver Network. At Braver Network, you'll find organizations from all across the country and all across the political spectrum that even when they disagree on the issues, come together to spark this movement for civic renewal. In building this network, we commit to equal representation, not just between conservatives and liberals, independents and nonpartisan groups, but also between national and community level organizations. At Braver Network, you'll find the whole gamut, from businesses and leadership organizations to educational and religious institutions, all committed to improving our politics and strengthening our nation. We're looking for leaders and members of all kinds of organizations who are ready to lead and take part in the movement. Joining is completely free, and the opportunities for collaboration are endless. Help turn the tides of toxic polarization. Check out BraverAngels.org to sign your organization up for Braver Network. In this episode, I spoke with Dr. Andrew Shanick, who is a teacher at the College of St. Rose. He's been there since 2005 and is the chair of the School Psychology Educational Psychology Department. Andrew specializes in cognitive and academic assessment, and lots of our conversation centered around his work and advocacy with regards to reading instruction and learning disabilities and diagnosing those things. We spent quite a bit of time talking about some of those related issues around teacher training, the professional development support, and I asked him for his take on things like IEP meetings and what those could and should look like, as well as getting into some of the best practices of instruction and his take on those kinds of things. Again, one of the things he advocates for is a better communication channel and discussion with school psychologists and speech language pathologists especially, so that they can do a better job of diagnosing and prescribing treatments and instructional responses to struggling learners. As always, I hope this is helpful, and here's my conversation with Andrew. 
All right, I'm here with Andrew Shannock, and Andrew's going to talk to us about assessment and school psychologists and speech language pathologist and lots of things to do with reading and dyslexia and, and science of reading and that kind of thing. But let's get him to uh, say hello and introduce himself, give a, a brief bio, which is uh, a little bit in flux, which he may talk about, but uh, <laughs> not necessarily relevant and pertinent to the conversation today, I don't think. Right. Yes. No. Uh, so, hi. So, uh, Dr. Andrew Shannock. Uh, I am uh, currently with the College of St. Rose, uh, and I've been there for about 19 years. And uh, prior to that, I was a school psychologist for many years uh, in the field in Philadelphia, in upstate New York, uh, in rural, urban, suburban districts, uh, K through 12, um, in parochial schools, private schools, public schools, the whole lot, and doing independent evaluations. So all of that prior to getting into academia, and now uh, what I do, uh, my main my main area of expertise is around assessment, uh, especially around cognitive and academic assessment, and the identification of learning disabilities using both MTSS and this model called uh, PSW or the Pattern of Strengths and Weaknesses. Um, so I go around the country and I consult with different districts, and or do presentations for all different types of professional organizations. Uh, speech language pathologists, school psychologists, administrators, uh, everybody, and to talk about how we could work more efficiently together and ultimately uh, make things saner, not sane. There's no way to make things sane within the schools. There are too many little kids running around <laughs> and there is uh, too much stuff going on. Uh, and so just a, those slight increments mean a lot within schools that I'm finding. And so I try to help out districts around that. I try to help them implement policies and procedures around MTSS and also about data collection and understanding what an evaluation means and what does a learning disability mean. Okay. So those are my main things I help out with districts. Yeah, and, and you said okay. MTSS as in Mary? Uh, I'm not familiar as with in, that. As in a multi-tier system support. Okay. All right. Uh, so uh, it is. Uh, and I apologize. I may cough a little bit. Just uh, just getting over a cold. So so trying to get through that. No worries. But uh, it's it's just it's really a system to try to really establish resources to students uh, that so that you you're able to provide the necessary instruction and level of instruction to different students that uh, generally uh, most or divide things into three tiers. So when you think about a tiered approach to schools that you have tier one, tier two, and tier three. Tier one would be 85% of your class. Tier two would be those kids who are not awful, awful, but they're having some difficulty and need a little extra support on top of what already is going on in the general ed classroom. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's about 10%. And then you have this bottom 5% that's really well behind their peers. But again, not learning disabled, but they just may not have been taught correctly or just need a really big dose of academic interventions or even behavioral interventions uh, to start moving on the pathway uh, towards uh, some type of recovery and closing the gap between them and their peers. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, a lot of people think that it's a way to get the kids right back to grade level immediately, but sometimes that's not necessarily going to happen. Uh, and that it's really a lifelong treatment rather than an immediate cure. Mm -hmm. And so teachers, so it, it, teachers are often under pressure of just if you're in fifth, if you're a fifth grade teacher, uh, sometimes you get these weird mixed messages, especially after COVID, uh, mm -hmm. that a lot of kids might be like two years behind. So they'll have a kid that's maybe reading at a second or third grade level. And so they're told, teach the kids where they're at. And by the way, by the end of the year, get them to fifth grade level. <laughs> right, right. And they're just like, what? what? So what do you want me to do here? Right, and right. so they get really put under pressure and they're not necessarily sure. And they're, uh, some of their training and knowledge hasn't really set them up uh, to, to be as effective as they want to be uh, mm -hmm. just yeah. from their own training. And then just the professional development and support and background and what they get from administrators isn't there necessarily to help them out. Uh, a lot of the times, yeah. um, which is unfortunate. So they're, they're really put put under the gun for these things. Uh, and I'll say that, which also then leads to higher rate of referrals for a kid to be identified with a learning disability, mm -hmm. which is a neurological issue. So that means the kid has been taught correctly, but still is not learning, reading, writing, or math. But if they haven't been taught 
how to read, write, or math, then my evaluation is not going to be necessarily helpful to identify a learning disability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Because their performance is going to be they're going to they're going to be a weak reader, but it's not because of a neurological issue. It's because they haven't been taught correctly, not for any malice. All right. All right. Meant it's just maybe lack of information about what to do and and possibly skill or the nature of the classroom, all that kind of stuff can, all those factors can have an impact. Right, right. Well, I want to back up just a little bit and Please. and fill in maybe some of the gaps just uh, just for context. So you, you were a school psychologist, you said, so you worked in schools. Correct. I'm curious to to sort of unpack that a little bit. Uh, I think you said, you know, a number of settings and that kind of thing. So, you know, unpack that a little bit for us. Like, what was that like? What what, did, what were some of the takeaways? How did the job change over the years? Because I think it certainly has. Um, guidance counselors, which is not the same thing as school psychologists, but there's some overlap there, has, I think, changed significantly. People think of the school psychologists sometimes as counseling roles, and I don't think that's probably very typical anymore. And it's more about metrics and testing and you know assessment and evaluation. So, yeah, kind of unpack that if you would. Yeah, and I think uh, to the latter, and I think that's the misperception of school psychologists that we're just doing testing hmm. and metrics kind of thing. Uh, that is, and and just you know, I love and my my uh, love within school psychology is about testing. I love, oh my God, I can't get enough of it. Uh, <laughs> super great, big fan. I tell I tell the story all the time, like when uh, the new Woodcock Johnson, the cognitive measure came out and I pulled the cellophane wrapper off and that new test smell, <laughs> I was all excited. I was all into it. And I felt bad for the first kid I tested because it's like 21 subtests. I'm like, I'm doing them all just yeah. to kind of learn. <laughs> and the poor kid by the end was like, I'll be good at school. Just let me leave. <laughs> so, um, but... Uh, as much as I love assessment, it is really uh, doing uh, a whole bunch of different things in the school psychologist that I do do counseling. I do do group work and individual work. I do lots of, I want to do as much consultation as I can uh, with the teachers to help them within the classroom, uh, to really be the right-hand person of the administrators, to assist them in policy and procedure implementation, uh, to understand the mental health of the school building, that uh, I think you're right in terms of where uh, school counselors have really changed a lot. In part, it's because of the level of mental health issues that are going on, not just with our children, but also with our faculty and staff. Mm -hmm. what, do, what do we say? Well, we'll stick them all in a little room and see what happens. <laughs> right? It's just something's bound to go off. And so school psychologists are one of the best trained professionals within the schools in terms of uh, the amount of training they get versus the other professions. And that's not a knock on any of the other professions. It's just the facts. And that <clears throat> we're really the psychologist that knows the most about education and the educator that knows the most about psychology. So it's really broad and deep of what a school psychologist knows and their skills. And you have, uh, I think, when you bring up like doing testing and metrics, I think sometimes especially a lot of districts and administrators will think that is what school psychologists do. Mm -hmm. But that is one, it's up to the school psychologist to say, no, I have way too many student loans just to do this darn thing. <laughs> but that I have all these other skills. So use me so that you get more bang for your buck. Right. And so uh, when I was in the schools, uh, because of that mindset, I made sure I was doing everything. I was not going to sit in my office and do testing all day. That was not going to happen that I was going to go out there and I'm going to know all the kids. I'll be in the hallways. People will, that I want to make sure that the kids knew that coming to the school psychologist's office wasn't a bad thing. Hmm. That it was just something easy. Everyone knew, you know, that I'm just a funny bald guy kind of thing. You know, it's okay <laughs> to come on in and chat about things and let people know and introduce myself to go into different classrooms. I did lessons in classrooms mm -hmm. about mental health and about big problems, small problems. What are they really trying to help out kindergartners around that? Uh, working with adolescents, which I really loved. I, I really liked working with the adolescent population the most. Mm -hmm. um, uh, maybe in part because I felt so bad for them because they're going through adolescence mm. uh, and just wish them the best all the time. Mm -hmm. And But that's really difficult stuff. And yeah trying to be there for the kids and, and the faculty and also being a parent advocate right. that, uh, and that, I, and I hope it's okay. I keep going a little bit here in terms of like where the yeah. schools that it's, it's, um, schools aren't the friendliest of places for parents, unfortunately. 
Mm -hmm. but they're our main consumer. So it's a weird kind of thing where that the parents feel like they're being talked down to or that it's not really that there's a disconnect sometimes. So and 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 I think the school wants to do better by the families. They want to do better by the communities and that there, you have this talking past each other. So one of my main things was really to be a strong parent advocate and working with those parents, telling them what to expect in a meeting, telling them what I'm going to say in a meeting, but also give the parents the ability to understand any assessment that I may have done, that I'll talk them through it all before they come to a meeting where like they have eight people staring at them, not knowing what they're going to, is going to hit them. And to give them, and but I want them to be able to advocate for their child later on, because I'm not going to be there all the time. Mm -hmm. So, in terms of the change of the field, I think a lot of the stuff I just talked about is is happening more and more than it was in the past, where they were just kind of stuck doing testing. I think. Yeah. Uh, but um, my my push for all school psychologists do this wide band of things that you were trained on that the National Association of School Psychologists provides all these standards for what school psychologists should do. And we really should be able to do all those standards relatively well within the schools. Mm -hmm. And I think school districts are really missing out and not utilizing our skills enough. Well, there's a few things, uh, little threads there, I think might be interesting to pull on um, if you'll indulge me. So one of the things mm -hmm. that you mentioned is, you know, sort of advocating in parents and parents' roles, which made me right. think about this sort of, I don't know if they're called this every every place, but you know IEP meetings, right? So right, right. The meetings where and teachers will very likely be very familiar with them, and and oftentimes feel you know kind of uh, cynical about them, negative about them, Should because be. they tend to be uh, they tend to feel like, at least in my experience, uh, that you know we're sort of jumping through hoops and you know just a sort of paperwork bureaucratic one of those things that teachers don't have time. For even right. if even if you know like you say well this is I I understand the sort of well-meaning goal here but this isn't particularly helpful or it feels just like we're sort of checking boxes that were already checked before we came in it's just a rubber right. stamp or something like that so right. how do you think about those IEP meeting kinds of things and because essentially that's sort of where the interface with especially kids with learning disabilities or behavioral disabilities and parents and schools and oftentimes in a negative context sort of show up. Yeah, um, I, I think it. they are. It, it's a bizarre kind of thing, the meetings. And they, it, that uh, unfortunately, my joke when I go to different districts is that I go, I love IEP meetings because they're always so different all the time. Hmm. And everybody laughs because we all know it's the same meeting right. over and over and over again. And that we all go around and we say, oh, Johnny's such a good boy. He works so hard. He still can't read, but he's great. Yeah. And the next person goes and they go, oh, if I had 20 Johnnies, right. <laughs> the world would be such a great place. He still can't read. Right. And then we go to the next person and, we, and everyone says the same thing. And then we say, uh, so guess what we're going to do for even though he still can't read, guess what we're going to do for him next year? Every district I go all across the country says, repeats this whole thing. I say, so what are we going to do for that kid next year? They all say the same thing. We're going to do the same thing. <laughs> We're doing the same thing for a kid that didn't work for nine months, but next year he'll have Mr. Smith. And somehow Mr. Smith will be able to do everything, including the current teacher we're insulting. Hmm. That teacher's like, oh yeah, Mr. Smith is awesome. <laughs> In essence, the the uh and no mouse is meant right we're trying to everyone's working their tails off but they're not sure of the specific interventions or the the things to do to assist those kids especially in the area of reading or writing or math mm -hmm. really address some of those issues especially at the special ed level so that they are working tremendously hard uh, there's no doubt but I imagine if i went to a doctor and the doctor and i said listen this pill is not helping my child for nine months and they say well we'll do uh, uh we'll change uh the striping on the medication right and do it for another nine months nobody would do that but for some reason we allow that happening in the schools and parents get re rightfully frustrated by it and so do the teachers mm -hmm. everybody knows that's what's happening 
but we're not sure what to do to kind of change that process. And that's where I try to help out districts in changing what that process looks like, what those meetings are like, uh, especially as the independent evaluator. I'll go into those meetings and I'll say, okay, does everyone here agree that Johnny's a good boy? Does everyone here agree that he's working hard? Does everyone agree that he still can't read? Yes, no, good, okay, good. So now what are we gonna do about it? What's the specific intervention? Where exactly is that kid? Give me a baseline and tell me what the goal should be. That discussion generally does not happen in those IEP meetings. What the kids get is double the amount of time to read a book they can't read and test it in a separate place that nobody knows about. Hmm. Rather than any specific, and no, and again, there's there's no no one means anything by it. They're just not sure what else to do. All right. So you mentioned you know the issue of teacher training and professional development support. And of course, we do a lot of professional mm-hmm. development. That's our main bailiwick. And right. you know there are certain inherent problems on, from all of the angles and stakeholders, and those are all important to to think about. One of the things that 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 we think about or I think has come to light with teacher training and professional development with regards to reading and the the, the teaching of reading, of mm-hmm. course, is the reading wars and the phonics and the science of reading and those kinds of things. Uh, I'm, I'm curious to hear how you think about that and, and you know, the balance of literacy versus, I guess, quote sure. unquote, science of reading and all those kinds of things, phonics okay. and knowledge and all those things. But As you're, uh, you know, maybe using some of this, the answer to this question to unpack this a little bit, one of the things that that strikes me as a question that's relevant is you're saying, all right, so if we're going to go into these IEP meetings or whatever that might look like and say, so how do we get Johnny to read, uh, not give him the same pill with another stripe? Well, we need to change the way that we're instructing and doing that instruction. And if the teachers aren't trained to do that kind of instruction, then that's a real problem. So, you know, like you, yeah. you you say, well, here's the prescription, but this school doesn't have, you know, if the school was a pharmacy, they can't, they, they can't actually deliver that. Right. And, and it's not, again, it's not out of malice. It's because right. they just haven't been trained. And, and, and in some cases, they've been trained explicitly in ways that, according to the data and according to the research, is not effective. So... Uh, yeah, I'm curious to, to get your reaction to that. Yeah, I mean, the the, the truisms are, and let's see if I say it right, because sometimes I mess this up, but that uh, doing an ineffective practice well does not help anybody. Mm. Not doing an effective process, effective way of teaching, is also not going to help anybody. Mm-hmm. So you have to do the right thing, but people sometimes, like when you talk about balanced literacy, some people do that really well, but it doesn't help those bottom... 30% of kids. Mm-hmm. And so then they, what do they do? They give them an extra dose of the bad curriculum mm-hmm. in tier two or tier three, or maybe even special ed. They, they give them extra doses of drugs that don't impact that symptomology. Mm-hmm. And then now imagine that happening year in, year out. The kids know that supposedly somebody's helping them and giving them bigger and bigger doses of the drugs. They have to blame themselves. They're like, what's wrong with me? Right? It's mm-hmm. just a, a wicked situation for all yeah, these yeah. kids. But yes, but when it comes to, it's not just teacher training. It's training for all the educational fields, especially I would say from administrators uh, to know what is good, um, what's good curriculum, uh, that they're the ones in charge of what reading curriculum is going on and how to kind of organize everything. They need to step up their leadership around it. And it's generally not there. Uh, right. Unfortunately, but I would say for all the education professionals, have the pro- that it comes from the, the teacher programs, the the educational programs. That's yeah. where if you want education reform, go to higher ed and look at the education programs. But in teacher, there's the uh, national uh, uh, teacher quality study. Um, I, I can't remember the exact uh, uh, reference, but NTQ or something like NTQC mm-hmm. or something like that. Um, they found that one percent of 201 graduate programs teach teachers how to teach math correctly, mm. 1%. So that it's just stunning when you read it. And then you start to think about, because if I ask educators how many in the room are bad at math, about 50% will raise their hands. Mm-hmm. I mean, you can't be bad at math and be 
you know, how are you teaching it if you don't know what math is? Mm -hmm. And so then I get upset because then you have those people who say they're bad at math. I get upset the teachers who made them feel bad at math. Again, not because of malice, just because they didn't know what to do. But then I get mad at the higher ed programs that weren't teaching the teachers about how to teach math. Mm -hmm. So it's and again, even the teacher ed programs are trying to do the best with just what they have and, and the knowledge and how to kind of change things up. Uh, they are working unbelievably hard as well. So to the extent that you have a prescription and are willing and interested in sharing, I'm curious what what you would see as effective reading instruction and the elements of reading instruction. You know, you've got, again, science of reading, balanced literacy, reading recovery, sure. phonics, knowledge, all those kinds of things. And just, you know, sort of the same question with the teaching of math. You say, well, you know, they're not, right. they, they don't know how to teach math well. What, right. would you, what would you see or what do you, what have you seen as, as, prescribed for doing that well what are the elements of, of both of those in your opinion yeah i mean uh you have uh, different uh programs that are either research-based or evidence-based right now and the research-based <clears throat> will be based on the research but that program let's say it's the leopard program there's no necessary um evidence that the leopard program works but it's built off of the research for the science of math or the science of writing or the science of reading um, you have stuff like uh, uh, CKLA uh, by, a, um, uh, I'm going to say Acadian, so that's not true, Amplify. Um, and that there's lots of good research that it's built around, uh, but it's, uh, I don't believe yet it's uh, necessarily evidence-based. But there's, it's, it's really, it's a nice program that's built around the research of, of the science of reading. Hmm. Um, if you go to, uh, well, yeah, so... Um, you also have listen the the things orton gillingham people know about or wilson program may help out kids with learning how to read but then you also have for upper levels for those kids who can read the words but may not understand may and may also have the language around it uh that they may still have some difficulty with comprehension so there are different ways of looking at comprehension so if you look at the reading comprehension blueprint a really good book to kind of explain about different ways of uh, implementing good reading comprehension uh, instruction to kids. Um, you have, uh, but also just knowing the, the, you know, you have the science of reading, then you have this one mathematical formula called the simple view of reading, which is uh, decoding times language comprehension equals reading comprehension. Mm -hmm. In essence, what that means is that you have to be able to read the words and the words you read, you understand, and that's gonna help you comprehend. So if I if I can't have access to the text, meaning I can't read the words, then I'm not going to be able to comprehend. And I've actually had teachers come up to me and say, you wouldn't believe he can't read the words and he also can't understand the text. I go, I hope so. You know, that would be magic if he could. Hmm. But also you have to be able to understand the words you're reading. So I could read Spanish just fine, but God help me if I know what the heck I'm reading. Mm -hmm. So I'm also not going to comprehend. Mm -hmm. So when I look at the, and especially like say third, fourth grade or further up, a lot of the times the interventions around comprehension, when it really possibly should be about their ability to decode the words or their vocabulary. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. They're doing the wrong, they're doing a wrong intervention because they see the kids having difficulty with comprehension, but the kid doesn't have, either have access to the text or understands what the text means. Mm. So they're doing these things that aren't really workable until you work these other skills out. And so, but it also tells me, because then the schools will say, well, we don't have people, we don't have the time to do this. I'm like, if you have a room that you're working with five kids about comprehension and they all need decoding training, well, then that means you have the room, you have the space, and you have the adult who could do that because you're already doing that already, but you're doing the wrong medication in that moment. So what do we need to address? We really need to do more morphology for those older kids. Morphology is great because you start to learn the root word, you learn about suffixes, prefixes, and you can build your vocabulary while you're also building your spelling, which also leads to good reading. Mm -hmm. So it really just go, piles off, it, it works off one another to kind of build on that. And then the other, the bigger missing piece is the data collection to see if anything, if that, whatever you're doing is working. 
Yeah. So you mentioned, the, I think you said the sort of bottom 30% as far as academics and, or achievement in, in reading. I don't know if that's how closely corresponding that is with dyslexics. Uh, I am, I'm reminding, or your, your rhetoric reminds me of a really good friend of mine who, mm-hmm. whose mom was uh, an educator, was actually well known, very well known. And, and, you know, thought very highly of herself as an educator for a lot of good reasons, but right. he is dyslexic and mm. she did not recognize that and would, you know, just say, you, you know, you've got to try harder. You've got to, you know, just it's, it's sort of like right. th- this weight is too hard, heavy for me to lift and well, just try harder, you know, right. and obviously if it's not possible, it's not possible. And there was some, some, things in his brain that made that nearly impossible, especially doing right. the things that they were doing. And so I'm curious about that that bottom 30%. You know, when I talked with and we did our reading panel, a uh, reading wars panel with mm-hmm. Emily Hanford and Natalie Wexler and Kate Wynn and then Mickey Ray, who's the chief academic officer here in Kentucky. You know, one right. of the things that surface there that most people who who you know sort of travel in this space is like basically something like I think it's like sixty percent of kids will learn to read sort of even with balanced literacy or, or you know without doing explicit phonics that kind of thing, uh, which begs the question of like the sort of forty or thirty percent right. So like right. if these kids aren't able to decode and read, then it's such an impediment to their success, and then there's downstream effects and all those kinds of things. So. Uh, I guess, you know, fill in the, the gaps on dyslexia and maybe some of the things that people may not understand about dyslexia and when you're doing some assessment pieces and then thinking about interventions, especially with, with uh, you know, regards to reading instruction. Yeah, um, and I, I think that's uh, 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 well cap, uh, captured there in, in, in how you're kind of framing some of that. That. Uh, generally, I think you're right, like 60, 70 percent, no matter how you teach kids, they'll learn how to do some reading. Now, when you say that, you have to think, of, let's say we have a, a 20 kids in a classroom. That means 14 kids are reading OK. The number one kid is off the charts. Mm-hmm. Number 14 is still like just barely above water, if you want to say, mm. in terms of their proficiency. And then you have those other six, six kids who are really just not sure what the heck is going on. Now, if I was a teacher and I said, listen, 14 of my kids are doing well, but six are not, well, then I have a good program. I could understand that thinking, but they're comparing the wrong number. The numbers should be about 95 to 98% of our kids should be proficient readers if we do the right curriculum. Hmm. That means that we should have 18 to 19 kids of the 20 that are readers with one or two kids that are struggling. And, Does that and, make sense? And why would, what would be the reason for those one or two kids struggling where the others are not? And that, that's where it's thinking about the dosage where now for those kids, they may need an extra dose, tier two or tier three of intervention to help those kids uh, uh, figure out or break the code or build up their vocabulary or their, their language base so they can be better readers. So that's, but right now, those six kids and the, the way we have it now are being referred. And it's actually much more than that, which I'll get into in a second here. Mm-hmm. But now, now, but if you, even if we take the six versus one or two, mm-hmm. think about the burden of resources to tier two, tier three with six kids versus one kid being referred. Mm-hmm. Right. That's, it's a big difference uh, because you want to make those groups small enough where that kids have an opportunity to make mistakes and be corrected immediately for those mistakes. So, uh, but right now, uh, now mind you, my, my um, uh, experience is based on skewed experiences because people bring me in because things aren't going so well in the schools, hmm. right? If uh, generally, and when I talk to large audience, like 200 in a room from different districts, I'll say, uh, so how many of your kids, what percent of your kids are or should be receiving tier two or tier three or special ed services? Mm-hmm. Without fail right now, they're saying 50 to 60%. It's supposed to be 15% hmm. 
that it, or a tier two, tier three. Mm-hmm. But everyone's saying 50 to 60%. So instead of that of those 20 kids, now we have 10 or 11 kids being referred for tier two or tier three, mm-hmm. which is draining the resources. Which means that the tier one curriculum where that good, like that CKLA program I was talking about, mm-hmm. if that was being done with fidelity and effectively, it really should be maybe uh, 15 to 10% of the kids would need tier two or tier three. And if those kids, now let's say in an ideal world that we have a kid who's in tier two or tier three for about a year and just really good dosage of all the right curriculum, if things aren't working there, some people will say that's enough information to say that kid's learning disabled because we are giving them a good dosage of the right medication, the intervention. Therefore, that kid's learning disabled. I say that there should be an addition in terms of the PSW, the patterns of strengths and weaknesses, doing more normative, cognitive, and academic measures to see why that kid may not be able to read. I think that was the initial point of your questions. Like, well, why aren't those kids reading? The first, the first answer that I, the hypothesis has to be the kid wasn't taught reading correctly or didn't get a big enough dose. Mm-hmm. But they did get a big enough dose and they were getting the right medication. Now I really want to go into the brain and figure out why this might be happening. And that's where a school psychologist assessment generally comes from. And looking at the kid's working memory, their reasoning skills, their um, their retrieval skills, their ability to work under time pressure, all these different things that could have impact. To what degree? That's a question uh, that could have impact of why this kid has had difficulty reading or doing math or doing writing. Mm-hmm. So that's where it's, it should be right now. A lot of most states have that you could do this thing, MTSS or RTI or a PSW approach, pattern of strengths and weaknesses. It really should be. And that I want to make sure the kid did get all the right instruction first. And now I'm going to go ahead and do my testing mm. to kind of see why. But if I find out the kid wasn't taught reading appropriately, then I can't really identify the kid with a learning disability. So this question might be redundant, but yeah. be it, it's it's re, it's resonating. It, it's very resonant that the idea uh, or or sort of the the causes of so many kids being in tier two, tier three, is at least strongly correlated, if not causal. In coming from a a problem with the type and level, uh, the quality level of instruction, hmm. and if that's true, what what would you? What is your prescription if you have one? Right, uh, it's a big one. Uh, yeah. to fix that. Why why are we not getting, in your opinion, why are teachers not able to or Maybe if they're able, they're not doing it, but I, it, that doesn't seem to be true. Uh, delivering the best quality instruction. Yeah, and and uh, again, all the teachers want to. They all want to do it right. Sure. And they're all there. Yeah, no they, teacher gets in the business to uh, say, right. well, I want to make sure my kids can't read and don't know anything. Right. <laughs> right. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real frustration. And like I said, I think from their training programs, mm-hmm. Haven't really set them up appropriately. And again, the training programs are trying to work hard, but they may not, because of different uh, institutional pressures, may make it difficult to kind of change things up. Um, but that, uh, but then you also have the issue of changing administrators. Administrators have just a huge impact on, as to the culture of the school. So let's say I have one administrator that really understands the science of reading, really understands MTSS, and starts to implement all the policies and procedures and getting that stuff done. And then even the, and all the faculty buy into it. And then that administrator leaves after three years and another administrator comes in who doesn't have that knowledge. Mm-hmm. Even though all the, the faculty want to do what they're doing, but the administrator nixes it, it's nixed. So it becomes this weird kind of thing of not knowing what to expect next. And there's always a new fad. Mm-hmm. The more you're in education, the more you see things come and go. Right. And, or repackaged in so many ways. Right. Initiative fatigue right. and leaders that 
don't follow right. through as you're mentioning or there's churn right. and yeah right. so, so 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 how do we fix comes, that right <laughs> yeah so i think it, it comes to that uh each teacher and each school and as a school psychologist what i say to them is is really going in and working with maybe one classroom right you can't make it sane you have to make things saner so i can't try to fix everything all at once but i can impact that teacher's philosophy on how to deliver their instruction that they're delivering and by showing them the data they could collect to see all the work is paying off for them because that's really important. They don't often get that data, but I want that data to be immediate for them. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to work with that one teacher. And then uh, maybe that one teacher myself will do a professional development for that grade level. This is what we're doing. This is how we're changing things. This seems to be working for us. For this year, let's just work at this second grade level. Let's see how we could, what's happening in second grade. Mm -hmm. And then the following is that now I get a couple of the teachers from the second grade level to present to maybe third grade. Hey, this is what we did last year. This is the expectation. We had some hiccups here. This is what's happening. Maybe we, you hear the things that we learned about. But everyone wants to fix it right away so all kids are at grade level right now immediately. And when it doesn't happen immediately, and it's really hard to see, everybody thinks the work that they did had no impact. So they're less motivated to do anything going forward mm -hmm. because they're like, oh, what do you want me to tell you? Six kids are going to struggle in reading. That's it. Right. Well, one of the things that I know you advocate for, and, and I think it's probably smart to talk a bit about this, is the intersection or I guess the cooperation that would be really helpful between speech language pathologists and school psychologists. So... Uh, I'm fairly ignorant about that because that's just not my bailiwick generally. Right. But I'm so I'm curious to to hear more about that and what you think it could be and and should be and and maybe I guess what it is right now. It's assuming they're sort of working in in silos and not really having much crosstalk. Yeah. Um. And and that uh, it's you know, and again the whole the whole silo thing has always been interesting that. Uh, no, no one's trying to work in silos. They're just doing whatever they got to do. And there, there's, but, but generally there are bridges, but not well-built bridges between the various professionals. Um, that, that's what I'm trying to, to help out folks doing. That uh, speech language and school psychologists are generally, uh, generally some of the leaders within school buildings, especially around those kids who might be having difficulty in reading or writing or uh, for a whole bunch of different academic and behavioral issues. Um, but that <clears throat> they do these normative measures <clears throat> that measure stuff like uh, your reasoning skills, your vocabulary, your ability to problem solve, uh, your ability to work under time pressure, and even your phonemic awareness, those kind of things. They both do assessments in that area. And so, uh, but this is, but they do it in isolation of each other without talking to one another. So I may do this IQ test, which for whatever it is, and I look at all these different abilities and I do that on a Monday. On Friday, the speech language pathologist does the assessment that measures a lot of the same things I did. So, and sometimes a kid says, I did this already. And then you go into a panic. You're like, oh my God, what is that? No, I read the folder. <laughs> You've never gotten this testing before. And, but, I do this weird test. For, I'll give you an example. I do this weird test as a school psychologist. I give him a bunch of numbers and the kid has to repeat those numbers back to me. That's one of the measures. It's a working memory test. Mm -hmm. And I score that up. What I ask a lot of school psychologists, I say, would you do that test again on a Friday, the same exact test, and score it up? And everyone says, no, appropriately so. That, that's test retest. You can't do that based on stats and metrics, all that kind of stuff. And I'm like, well, no, that happens all the time. Because guess what the speech language pathologist is doing? They give the kid a bunch of numbers and ask them to repeat the numbers back to them. They do the same, literally the same exact subtest. And it's why not get the speech? If I do my battery of tests, my battery may not measure everything so super well. So I could, what I do is I cross the batteries. I pick maybe another testing battery. So for example, if I use the whisk. That's a cognitive measure mm -hmm. okay? uh, that, that looks at IQ. 
uh, I may choose a speech language measure or use the speech language you did a test like called the CTOP. That's more of a phonemic process, uh, phonemic awareness kind of stuff, but it has memory and all this other kind of stuff on that. Mm -hmm. A lot of those mem measures I may have done, but there are some of those measures I did not. I would use some of those measures to confirm any of the data I have. Does that make sense? So, so it's really being more efficient with the assessment rather than doing double the amount of testing. Mm -hmm. that it, the, ultimately I say that uh, if you had the option of uh, eight needles or three needles but both will give the same result depending on your personality you're, you're typically you take the three needles versus the eight right right and so so uh, but the real important process here is that language impacts any of my cognitive measures my neurological cognitive measures but cognition and neurology impact any of the language measures so if I just interpret from my one narrow lens of neurology and not thinking about language, I may mis, um, misinterpret the data I have. Mm -hmm. The same thing goes with the speech language pathologists. If they're not coming from more of a neurocognitive type of point of view, they may misinterpret uh, the data for something else. I'm not saying they're right or they're wrong or I'm right or I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. But unless we confer, we're not going to get a better diagnosis. So sharing of information, having conversations so that there's a better outcome with a more full set of data and considerations and, and approaches, right? And it's, it's a more efficient approach. Right. Because, and, because we're, and we're decreasing the amount of tests. That's right. We're decreasing the amount of tests and increasing our, uh, our um, identification or being specificity of the disability. Right. Whether and, it's a speech language or whether it's a learning disability. And and again, ostensibly more effective because you're increasing the, I, in, at least in some ways, the data set and, and sources, but also increasing, I guess, the expertise because a school psychologist brings a set of expertise and the speech pathologist brings a set of expertise and putting those together right. in a conversation should ideally right. yield better results and a, and a better sort of prescription and plan. So right. whose who's responsibility, maybe that's not the best way to frame it, <laughs> if you say, well, how do we get this done? Is it is it the responsibility, Is it would it be best to place that responsibility on school psychologists and say, hey, reach out to speech pathologists or vice versa, mm -hmm. or say, hey, leaders, school leaders, principals, mm -hmm. superintendents, whatever, uh, right. make sure that this is happening, or maybe it's all of the above. Yeah, it, it is definitely all of the above. And so it's it's fascinating of, uh, and, and I apologize to talk about, you know, sometimes I'll do presentations for the school psychologists. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they'll always say is like, oh my God, I wish my speech pass were here. Or I wish my administration was here, mm -hmm. administrators are here. If I do it for the administrators, like, oh my God, we should have invited all the school psychs in the speech pass here. I'm like, right, I, I told you that. <laughs> you know, we all have to get together on this right. to work it out. And to go beyond what we have been trained to do in our training programs and to think, to understand each other's role and to understand what everyone brings to the table. Because then now let's go back to what we originally talked about in terms of those IEP meetings. Sometimes you have the speech language pathologist say a whole bunch of stuff. The school psychologist say a whole bunch of stuff. The OT say a whole bunch of different stuff. If they all work together on an evaluation together, then it's just one voice, five minutes, knock it out, rather than five minutes for each. Mm -hmm. So the, 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 again, when we think about a kid who is having difficulty in reading, and I mean really struggling, that kid is suffering. Parents are seeing their baby suffer. Right. There's no doubt. It's awful. Right. But now let's take that to the medical point of view again. If I, my baby was suffering with some medical issue and my baby has four doctors, would I ever allow one doctor to do anything without conferring with the other three doctors? Generally not, right? I want everyone's opinion. But for some reason in the schools, we let it happen. The SLP could do their assessment. The school psychologist could do their assessment. The OT could do their assessment, all working with the same kid from different lenses and not really collaborating and being more efficient because our tests are invasive. Mm -hmm. They are invasive. Sure. Right? I, again, I told you, I love them. But let's say the kid has bad working memory. Right? How many times do I have to measure working memory before we all say he has bad working memory? Mm -hmm. 
right? I had, I had one kid once I said, okay, I'm going to say a bunch of numbers. I want you to repeat them backwards. And he went, no. I was like, no, that's what I'm going to do. He's like, yeah, no, I can't do that. And I said, well, too bad. Here we go. <laughs> I went three, seven, five, whatever it was. He's like, yeah, no, I can't do that. <laughs> so what? I have to give more tests. He just told me exactly what's wrong with him. Hmm. And yet we just pile on in order to get some type of number. So yeah. we think more about the test rather than the kid, which is unfortunate. Yeah. And is it your contention that because of the sort of inefficiency in, in the system that we're not accurately diagnosing things like dyslexia mm-hmm. uh, at when when they should be diagnosed and that i guess because of that i mean if you're not diagnosing it it stands the reason you're not right. not treating that con- that condition well uh, uh but our, i guess the, the the i guess the the fundamental question is is there a problem with the accurate and uh, you know getting all of the kids who have learning disabilities including and and outside of dys- dyslexia right. getting them accurately diagnosed yeah, we, we definitely have too many false positives and too many false negatives, especially amongst uh, the English language learner population. Hmm. That's a whole nother situation. And it's just, uh, it, it's awful. Uh, we're not doing right by these kids, uh, especially with the big migrant uh, populations coming in. Mm-hmm. Uh, schools really aren't sure what to do. And that's, uh, it's that what type of assessments or diagnostics can be done before the school psychologist does their normative measures that can I do some fluency measures to see and what type of screeners can I do to see if the kid might not be prepared to read at that moment. Uh, so I, I get, I get cautious saying like using dyslexia screeners mm-hmm. because dyslexia in itself is, is not well defined amongst different communities. Everyone talks past each other when they use that word. Mm. And so I think a lot in a lot of cases, especially let's say 15 years ago, when we were identifying kids with dyslexia, it was done improperly. And so lots of people now think they're dyslexic when they were just diagnosed with it, but improperly. We're much better at it now. Hmm. But still, the misdiagnosis really impacts people in their lives going forward. I'll give you an example. Uh, the WISC, which is a popular cognitive measure mm-hmm. uh, that gives an IQ score, whatever it might be. Within the ingredients that make up that IQ does not include phonemic awareness. So the main ingredient for reading phonemic awareness is not included in this overall IQ. Hmm. So how could you possibly identify a reading disability if you're missing the key ingredient? And that's what happens across the country because they just... What they've been told is do this test, get a number, do achievement test, get a number, compare those numbers and see if the kid's disabled or not. Mm-hmm. Rather than do this measure to find out more about this child, do this other, other measure to find out their the specific skills they may have in reading or writing or math, and then try to use some of your clinical knowledge to really formulate what might be going on. And does this kid need just an extra dose of reading or writing or math, whatever it might be? Or is this really a neurological type of issue? Or is this a language issue? How does language impact it? How does all this stuff kind of go hand in hand to make that ultimate diagnosis? Yeah. Well, and that it should be hard So to do. It actually, and this is maybe a bit off topic, I'll, I'll get on a little bit of a soapbox here, but one of the yeah. things that we advocate for here, and I'm... I'm a very strong advocate of inquiry teaching and learning, inquiry-based teaching, inquiry-based mm-hmm. learning, uh, with the recognition that it can and, and often is done poorly. It should include things like direct and explicit instruction. I'll make those throat clearing disclaimers and all these kinds of things, <laughs> right? Uh, it is not the same as discovery learning, but when people mm-hmm. really focus on sort of the, the, the science of learning kinds of things that, you know, knowledge and mastery are such i think sometimes at least my perception is that there's such a focus on those things that it sometimes feels like and and explicitly some of the advocates do they're like inquiry is bad inquiry teaching inquiry based learning is bad for kids and that kind of thing so well it can be done poorly just like direct explicit instruction can be done poorly blah 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 but all that to say one of the things that i think 
why I think inquiry teaching and learning and doing it well is really important is that what we want is to build students into adults who are good critical thinkers and questioning and inquiry is a big piece of that. So right. it, to, to, to sort of use the analogy of the medical professional and right. I, when I go to a doctor, there are doctors I've been to who are sort of following steps and they have a sort of, uh, it's almost like a flow chart. It almost sometimes feels like when you, when you call, yeah, protocol, you, it's like when you call customer service for, you know, some tech, product and you get somebody right. uh, probably in India that they're following your script and you can tell they're following right. your script, right? And that's right. that's and sometimes that works just fine. But mm -hmm. when we have confounding variables and things in enter into the conversation and into that problem, what we need is somebody who can stop and think and be a little bit more creative with their inquiry process and problem solving process. And it happens with doctors, right? Because sometimes we have something that we have all these symptoms, but there's one little thing that it, so well, it's it's this diagnosis. It should be that by diagnosis, and it strikes mm -hmm. me that the same kinds of things are true here, right? Because not everybody's brain works exactly the same. So how do you not fall into that trap? That sort of protocol. We need practitioners, whether they're school psychologists, speech pathologists, teachers, whatever it might be to be able to and ready to problem solve and think and not fall into those protocols because one sometimes those protocols won't get us where where the students need to be and right. two it can i think lead to and sort of fall into this trap of sort of confirmation bias well this is the tool i have this is my hammer so i'm gonna find right. every nail that i can so uh, feel free to react to any or all of that i just yeah. feel like it just really struck me as like that's an example where i think inquiry teaching and learning is so important and not to be overlooked yeah, and I think it, it's it's that uh, the artistry of teaching that matters mm -hmm. and seeing who your class is. But I want to make sure the kids have all the skills first, and that's where the explicit instruction comes in. Mm -hmm. From math to reading to writing, all that kind of stuff, say, here. This, I want to make sure that you have all the necessary tools and skills to do things. Then I could explicitly also teach about how to make how to think logically about things, right? Let's think about even just the, uh, the word, the, if you go to in a crossword book, right? Logic problems, mm -hmm. where it'll be like, uh, the person who has a red hat is sitting next to John. Uh, then you have to figure out like who has what color hat, who's sitting at what part of the table. Right. So they're right. reading all that. And then they have to think differently and think deeper about each of those clues. Right. And now they're really building their, uh, critical thinking, what does that really mean? What am I thinking about here? And I could bring all that together. But if they can't read in the first place, they can't get there. Right. If they can't do the math, I could say do all the inquiry you want. But I don't know how to do the math in the first place. Sure. Uh, the same thing for writing, right? Mm -hmm. Just try to do different things. Well, I'm not sure how to spell because I don't know words. I don't understand sounds that go to different squiggles. Right. I need to explicitly teach those things. For And, and mind you, think about the broad range of kids in the class that uh for those kids who just pick up reading or writing and math just very naturally and we all have seen it mm -hmm. right that those kids are like what is how do you do that it's just magic what happens they just pick it up you know they they may uh benefit from you know what uh go figure out how to build a rocket and come back to me and talk to me later mm -hmm. right go do the research about it you know here are the different pieces and try to figure out this problem whatever it might be that they may really dig that Right? right. But they have those specific skills to be able to best inquire. Does that follow? Uh, yeah, yeah. Versus trying to do with the whole class. But you can then, it, in so many ways, to really try to work with those kids, maybe at the higher end, working with the kids at the lower end, and trying to uh, do some heterogeneous learning around that. Yeah. Um, but that is a class that you could still involve lots of explicit instruction. And it doesn't mean just one on one. Right. It means explicit instruction about a specific sure. task what we're going to do. Right. But that still has to be uh, a huge chunk of that teaching. Right. Uh, and without that, it's really hard. And I'm and by the way, I'm not saying that I won't identify the kid with learning disability. That's the weird conundrum I'm in as a school psychologist. But if I if I realize a kid really wasn't taught reading, 
how that if I give them a normative reading measure, they're going to perform low. Would that make sense? They, they haven't been taught reading, so sure, they, sure. you're going to perform low. But then I'm going to misinterpret that if I just look at the number. And then I find like some con some really good cognitive stuff that's really like say their working memories are good, their phonemic awareness good, all that kind of stuff is good, but their reading is low. Then I may say they're learning disabled, but it's not true. It's really more of a result of incorrect curriculum or that ineffective curriculum that was done well, mm -hmm. that that's why that kid wasn't reading. And for me to identify that kid with a learning disability, even using my speech language pathologist and doing all the really good stuff that we're going to be misdiagnosing a kid. Yeah, yeah. Does that, does that follow? I mean, just in terms of, because I understand, because it's more interesting when you do inquiry stuff, right? It's just fascinating to watch the kids kind of see the wheels w work. Yeah, it, it can be. And and to be honest, right. I think, you know, directing explicit instruction isn't necessarily, and you're not saying this, but the, mm -hmm. it doesn't necessarily mean drill and kill and, and, you know, boring and that kind of thing. Sometimes it, it can feel like that. And right. that, that's probably more of a poor practitioner part doing that. Uh, you know, the only caveat I would say, because I, 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 I agree with you, and I think this doesn't necessarily make me as popular in sort of progressive education circles of those who advocate for things that are less traditional, but mm -hmm. I, you know, I largely agree. So we, we want to include direct and explicit instruction. We have to build those foundational pieces. If you put it in the context of surface deep and transfer learning, surface, you, you can't do deep and transfer without the surface learning. So you've mm -hmm. got to make sure you're doing those things. The only caveat I would say is, and make sure that, that people understand, at least from my perspective, is that, mm -hmm. that it isn't necessarily, you know, step one, step two, step three, like, surface foundational stuff then deep and transfer like you can have some of those things going on at the same time not necessarily is that always the case but sometimes right. that is the case and and so we can ask the students to predict about things and then mm -hmm. build some of that knowledge and then come back and you know so uh, but I don't want to get too far afield on that and no. one but, of the things two, 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 two points so just real quick is that one I want the I want data mm-hmm before we start to move off of maybe some of that, what, what uh, you're you're talking as a surface kind of thing, mm. that when when eighty five percent of your class hits this mark, then maybe we can move on to this other stuff. But prior to let's so that you that rather than your gut feel kind of thing, let's use the data to kind of drive that. Uh, that would be helpful. Yeah. Uh, to to kind of figure that out. When was that class ready to launch into what you're thinking about mm -hmm. in terms of maybe that more discovery and predictable kind of stuff. But the same thing, that's where language comes in. Because reading comprehension is only as strong as our language comprehension. Reading comprehension won't go beyond that. Mm -hmm. So within that class, I want to have some so what would so let's talk, let's do this story. We read the story out loud, we're talking about what would you predict about this? And doing that and building the language and the vocabulary around that. So when the kid does have access to that text, they'll be able to do some of the things you're talking about. Because it's natural because you've done some of the language work within your classroom. Sure, sure. But those kids who might be in sixth grade reading at a second grade level, let's say, mm -hmm. when they start having more access to the text, they start to kind of be able to do some of those uh, good reading comprehension skills because they've done it via language at that point. Sure, and generally I agree, uh, one, but one of the things that we advocate, and we do a lot of work on project-based learning, for example, and so when we do that, one of those pieces that I think can be really powerful and is really important you know, for my two daughters has been I okay. think vital is to say, all right, here's our driving question, which is how can we create this in for this particular audience and this purpose, that kind of thing, and so clarifying product purpose and audience, blah, 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 but then, all right. all right, let's develop a list of things we need to know and learn, questions we need to answer in order to answer that big driving question. Of course, the teacher needs to do the preparation to make sure those questions you're pulling out in that need to know list are, are the same questions that you want them to think about from a content right. standard kind of thing, so that sort of co-facilitation or that co 
co-creation of that list and modeling that process of saying, all right, what do we need to know? And let's identify those things, which uh, I think is really powerful because, Mm -hmm. and then you say, all right, so let's teach those things. And that's where you do explicit instruction, right? So we need to know how to multiply decimals. Okay, so we're going to do that work. We're going to do explicit instruction, practice, evaluation, assessment, blah, 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 all those things that you would do in effective instruction. We need to know how to read this book. It might be, might be that, you know, okay, so we're going to practice reading, you know, when, when I'm coaching soccer, what do we need to know? Well, you need to know how to dribble, you need to know how to pass, you know how to turn, you know, all those right. things. All right. So that's why we're practicing and puts it in that context. But that piece of being able to helping students develop that skill of identifying the things they need to know, I think is a really vital piece as they get into mm-hmm. an adult world because not they won't have, in most cases, a teacher to teach them those things. And even mm-hmm. if they did, you know, they, they, they need to, as adults, I'm going to get married, so or I'm going to buy a house, or I'm going to pick a college, or whatever, figure out if I want to take the job. What should I think about? What are the questions I need to know and identify in order to solve that problem effectively? And that, to me, is a skill that that I that that falls into that inquiry piece that okay. is a really vital vital piece. So, okay, fair. Yeah, I dig it. Yeah. Well, one thing that I did have is a, is a question that came up earlier, and I'm I'm curious to get your your take on this. One of the pushbacks, yeah. certainly, on schools and teaching. We were talking about school psychologist role and helping kids and sort of counseling and that kind of thing. Mental health of kids, mental health of teachers. You know, social emotional learning is a big topic, right? It's a big hot topic. People from a more traditional, maybe conservative side of the aisle are pushing back saying, you know, number one, it's we just need to teach kids. Um, SEL is a waste of time. Two, teachers don't know how to do it well enough to do it effectively. Right. I don't know that they're particularly wrong about that. And right. uh, three, if you if you teach them and they have success in academic circles, that their their social emotional learning will come along with that. I don't think that mm-hmm. is completely true. Certainly, maybe some truth. Mm-hmm. So, how do you think about SEL in schools? I mean, it's it's it, it's. Uh, I think it does get. It's been politically muddled, like you say, uh, just like that's... everything else. That's right. Wonderful, right? Mm-hmm. That we can't talk about anything without getting some politics along the way, which I'm comfortable about. And and that's uh, that if kids feel safe, you're a better learner. Mm-hmm. That if you could empathize with, it, it's almost going. If you know, on the conservative side, in so many ways, I'm I'm seeing a lot more about. Well, we need to do more about civics in in the classroom. Mm-hmm. I'm hearing that more. Well, it's the same thing. How to be a better citizen? How to be a better human? Mm-hmm. How to be aware of others? How to be aware of other differences, how to be aware of yourself, how to be in the moment and how to think in the future, mm-hmm. uh, to kind of do all those things that to make it a community. And I don't mean a 1960s commune community. <laughs> I mean, in terms of a community of citizens within that classroom, that's when another kid might be sad, how can I better support that child not to make the that child who's sad happy at that moment Mm -hmm. but to be cognizant of that kid's sadness and how to uh uh maybe make that classroom day a little bit better for that kid or to know when to just say and or that sometimes you'll see about um you know uh if a kid uh, they'll they'll come up with a bench and and recess time and that if a kid has no one to play with, they sit on that bench and other people will go up to that kid hmm. rather than that kid just wandering alone. And you start to teach those things that how do you approach somebody else? And it's not so scary because you don't know what to do as adults, right? So we're trying to teach the next generation to be better adults and better to other people and to maybe not get into these bizarro shouting matches that have been going on that we see on the news all the time. Mm-hmm. Like, let me understand who you are. Let me understand who I am. And then let's get to the issue here. And so the social emotional learning is just, you, you have just too much research showing its benefits uh, for kids academically when done right. And that's where the school psychologist, the speech language pathologist, the school counselor, the school social worker really need to take a lead on all that and help out the teachers to be able to identify and what to do within the class, how to hold community meetings within their classroom, how to take pause. Uh, you know, you have sometimes in these schools where they have like serious behavioral issues. Mm-hmm. And so you waste so much time addressing all the 
you know, like from suspensions to deten- all this other nonsense kind of thing. All that's a tier one issue. That is a school based issue. I may take two weeks out from doing reading, writing, and math teaching to just talking about behavior. Let's talk about how we're going to work the day. You're not wasting time. You're just front loading the time to address the behavioral and mental health issues right there within that classroom Mm -hmm. so that you have better success later on. But we're under all this pressure to teach, 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 get, you know, stuff all the reading, writing and math down their throats. That some that that class, that building may not be prepared to do at that moment. So how do you address that as a larger community and then within your classroom as a smaller community? Yeah. And so the benefits definitely outweigh the negatives. But then people just kind of for their own political purposes, put children in front of them to take the hit. But they're really not doing it for the children. They're doing it for their other political agenda. And I'm talking both for the left and to the right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, which puts me over the edge all the time. <laughs> yeah, right, right, right. Well, maybe that's a good place to leave it. Good. So I want to make sure, and if there's anything that you that we didn't talk about that you want to talk about, certainly uh, let's, let's uh, pull that out. And then anything that yeah. you want to share as far as links and places that folks should find you. If you go to the St. Rose... Uh, website and look at school psychology, you'll be able to find my email. Mm -hmm. Uh, So that's um, S-H-A-N-O-C-K-A at S-T-R-O-S-E dot E-D-U. Uh, If you email me there, that's fine. Um, So so, uh, a couple of other links that would be really good in terms of, because you you asked about like what should be done for certain kids. Uh, If you go to the Reading Universe, so readinguniverse.com is a great website. Uh, it has like lots of free resources, lots of little videos, like two minute videos to kind of assist. Uh, that's terrific. Um, if you go to the Reading League, has lots of good information. Um, I'm not, uh, and some really good books around that. Um, if you go to uh, Parker Phonics, he has a free book about reading, which is terrific, and it has lesson plans. Um, if people want to email me for different lesson plans, I'll get them all free lesson plans. So it's it's not that, you know, there's plenty of res- resources out there that's for free mm-hmm. to teach reading, and writing, and math. If you want to do, if you want to learn more about math, uh, my favorite website is sarahpowellphd.com. Uh, it's s a r a h p o w e l l p h d dot com. Um, she has wonderful information. Um, Amanda Verna uh, I don't ask me to spell that, but uh, she's always terrific uh, in terms of a lot of her math work. Um, so there, there are some really nice websites, and and uh, maybe I will send you a couple of those links. Yeah, yeah. Well, to kind of add on to, um, hopefully, I'll have a website up, and I'll send that link to you as as well uh, for things. But um, in in terms of uh, uh, speech language and school psychs, that. The, at the end of the day, that if they work together, and not on every single, not for every single kid, on a few kids, right? Again, making things saner, not sane. Mm-hmm. That for a few of the kids, that they will save the kid at least one hour of assessment time if they work collaboratively mm-hmm. and don't overlap their tests. That they're not going to save me time because if I, if I'm able to remove, save an hour of time, I'm going to fill it with something else. Cause that's who I am as a school psychologist or a speech language pathologist, hmm. but I'm saving the kid one hour of unnecessary assessment. Yeah. That's a huge deal for them. And that I could be so, so I'm happy to talk that out and if they use the, there's a, Oh, the, the, to combine all the information from all the different measures is to look at the XBAS, so X-B-A-S-S. So if they use the XBAS, but they have to understand some of the theory to better use the XBAS, they'll be able to put all that data together to come up with new composites to better understand who that kid is. And it also has a really good section in terms of English language learners and how to do assessment around English language learners. On that last thing, and be, this will be my last little thing, would be that if you go look at uh, work by Sam Ortiz uh, at St. John's, uh, he has a website 
to help out folks around assessment of English language learners. All free stuff. All terrific. Okay. Well, Andrew, it's been a pleasure and, you know, certainly something that I think is really important. And we've kind of gotten into the reading wars kinds of things and and touched on some of those things here, but albeit from a different perspective. So hopefully, as as I always say, I hope hopefully folks have found it helpful. Okay, great. Thank you very much. I appreciate all the time. What we need to do is spend enough time together that we can start to translate our ideas into each other's language and include one another in this community of inquiry. And that is the work of love.